Now, uh, every month we have one of our MPs here in the West, uh, in the hot seat, to answer your questions. It gives you a chance to put a question to your constituency MP, if you happen to be, in this case, Bristol North West's constituency, or indeed an MP uh, who represents the wider interests of those in the West. Today, it is the turn of Charlotte Leslie MP. Good morning to you, Charlotte. Welcome. Morning, John. Welcome to everyone. No chilies, by the way. In, in, hot in, seat in, is a lot better than a yeah, hot chilli. Yeah, indeed. Hot <laughs> seat is better than a hot chilli. Uh, uh, Charlotte, let's start um, with one of the key issues that you have been driving in Parliament, which isn't so much a constituency issue, although you have hospitals in your constituency, the NHS. Why are you so passionate about it? Well, I mean, it's, I think often MPs are passionate about things they have personal experience of. Yeah. And my father's um, just retired as an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, he's been a surgeon for 30 years in, in the BRI and mm. Southmead. And I suppose I grew up watching my dad come in after a long day's work, um, being worn down by raging against the machine and increasingly it was raging to try and make sure that patient priorities and patient safety and what he needed to do to serve his patients was put against uh, was put ahead of increasing management priorities and management bullying and we'd have discussions over dinner and he'd raise another thing that had come up and how management was being difficult in getting what needs to be done done and I saw it wear him down and I was so angry about this a because it was so wrong that patient safety should be put second to, you know, meeting targets and all these management tick boxes. But B, it was my dad. And I hated seeing him fighting so hard against such an enormous machine. And, you know, ironically, I thought, well, I don't want to go into a job where I work weekends and rage against a machine. And, and so I became and, an MP. And, and, and that, now, now, now you're the MP for <laughs> exactly. Bristol Well, so, let's, let's just talk about that, because this is the dichotomy, isn't it? Is that doctors want to be doctors, they want to look after patients and they want to make certain that the patient recovers. That's their basic ESOP. Absolutely. The, the, the fundamental of the Hippocratic Oath. Doctors don't want to run hospitals. No, but what doctors do need to be able to do is drive the priorities of hospitals. Right. So in, in the Mayo Clinic in um, America, for example, there's sort of a very good pyramid of, of hierarchy. Mm. You have the doctors at the top who, who decide the direction, you know, what's a priority, and they use their medical expertise and experience to drive the directions. You have a layer of managers underneath them who facilitate that. So doctors don't want to be involved in the, you know, the administrative burdens of running a hospital. Of course they don't. So they charge, they charge the managers to manage manage their priorities. Yes, absolutely. And then, of course, at the bottom of the pyramid, if you can visualise it, you've also got the same clinicians who are at the coalface actually doing the work. Okay. So you've got the people at the top and the bottom are the practitioners, and the people in the middle doing the facilitating are the managers. What's happened, particularly over the last 10 years or so, is that the NHS has turned into a top-heavy management system. And, I mean, I, I will share with you, I once went for a check-up about something to, to a specialist, and, I, and I'd had my consultation. Mm. And he knew I was a candidate it and he, he wasn't political but he said to me at the end he said I've just got to be a little bit unprofessional he said please 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 can you do something to help us I'm seeing good professionals leave because we're being told to do stuff we, we, we shouldn't be doing it's putting patients at risk no one knows what to do everyone's really stressed out about it please can you help us and it was an extraordinary thing to happen at the end of a consultation which I think, again, would be, because obviously maybe the reason he did that was because he knew you were a candidate. I, I wonder, Charlotte Leslie, whether there is a danger within the NHS that it faces challenges and I, I, I put the challenge with regard to education secretaries out there when we were talking about education yesterday in the teacher strike, is name me a good health secretary. From any political party, it is one of those, like home secretary, it is one of those jobs that nobody wants. And whatever you do, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. From the point of view of the health care that you get, that I get, that the listener gets this morning. They were so busy running the NHS down. Every time we do a phone-in on this programme, the experience, 99% is good. I don't know what everyone's talking about. Whether you're in danger of, of raising issues that are important, but actually do more to undermine the N N NHS than do it justice. No, that's, that's a very good point. And um, one of the the, one of the reasons it matters so much and why I've done so much on holding NHS management to account mm. who've been stifling and in many cases bullying our clinicians is because the clinicians are brilliant. I mean, the reason that people get excellent care and they do get excellent care is because it's not managers like Sir David Nicholson at the top of the NHS doing a great job. It's doctors and nurses and, and you know, good, good managers. There are good managers who manage them doing an excellent job. Mm. And we absolutely, absolutely owe it to those people like my dad mm. who working day in, day out, against the machine to make the machine work for them. Okay. And, is Jeremy and, and Hunt doing the right the, thing, then? Yeah, I, I, I think he is. I mean, I've been very open and public about you think things... think he is? 
Uh, he is, but I've also been open and public about things I would have done differently. So I'm afraid I would have fired David Nicholson. He presided over an absolute scandal at Midstaffs, and he's also been the architect of everything we dislike in the system of the NHS. He's the top body who runs it. He's the top it. body, yeah, but yeah, also yeah. he's got a group of people around him. They all seem to know each other and write each other's references, who have presided over this culture of bullying, um, of um, targets over patient safety. And these aren't my words. These are words of independent people writing a report back in 2008 who said this. Now, if you want to change something, you've got to get rid of the head guy. If you want to turn a school around, often you change the head. I don't know why we've kept him in place. And I've been very open about my difference with the you Secretary see, of State on that. 0845 900 9 is the number that gets you to me and Charlotte Leslie MP here for your questions this morning on BBC Radio Bristol. She's in the hot seat. Let's return to the diversity of your patch. Now, you have a very interesting constituency. You've got Southmead, you've got Westby on Trim, you've got Hembury. Uh, you couldn't get more diverse areas if you tried. I think probably one of the most diverse constituencies in, in, in Bristol. Uh, let's deal with something that I know is, is, is a big contention for Shirehampton. Mm. Supermarkets. Now, <laughs> Shirehampton doesn't, isn't very well served, is it, supermarket-wise? No, I mean, it's, Shirehampton isn't very well served in lots of ways. You see so many, like the swimming pool, the Robin Cousins Centre, that area has really been stripped of a lot of facilities. We've well, got very little left in it. I, mean, I remember playing side of five-a-side football in the Robin Cousins Centre. I mean, we all talk about progress, but actually you look at areas like Shirehampton and we have definitely gone backwards. We're always mm. talking about modernisation and progress and how everything's getting better but the there's whole a time. massive. it's not just Shirehampton. There's a massive catchment to Shirehampton yeah. as well. You, for example, Westbury could go to Shirehampton. How uh, is that's an area that worries me mm. if I look at Bristol because it hasn't got a big supermarket mm. and it's one of those places where it needs one. How are you going to? In fact, we've got a question on that. Uh, Anna, come in. Uh, we've got a question on that now. For Actually, Charlotte. on this very subject, uh, Anne in Shirehampton got in touch. Uh, my question is why are there no other supermarkets in Shirehampton other than the co op? We have a co op supermarket, we also have a petrol station with a co op market attached. Now, she goes on to say some of the older people who do not have a car only shop there. Uh, why should they have to use the petrol? and extra time to travel to a decent supermarket. She goes on to say there are co-ops in Henleys, Sea Mills, Westby on Trim, Hembury and Avonmouth. People go on about Tesco's and Sainsbury's, etc. But we have not got any competition. Uh, many times I've asked Charlotte why and she replies that she's looking into it but has never given me a reply. There must be an answer why there is such a monopoly of that particular brand. Now's your chance, Charlotte Leslie. Um, it's we with the trouble is with things it doesn't happen as quickly as like you have we have got a coopoly if you want in in, in Shirehampton and we are currently with Wayne Harvey um, going to the supermarket the other supermarket um, operators and saying please 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 come to Shirehampton what they're saying is they don't think there's a market now that's really frustrating mm -hmm. because I'm saying and, and Wayne's saying look you've got a you've got a community who are crying out for your services now. Not that many. It's not often that communities are crying out for supermarkets. You usually hit the headlines because they don't it's want them. It's the other way around, yes. Um, but but here it, they really are, and also interestingly, the independent traders are because they recognise that with a big supermarket coming to Shirehampton, it'll bring people to the area and it'll increase their trade. So it I would, would make the area more vibrant. Absolutely, again. people would come to Shirehampton to do their supermarket shop and then use the high street. And one of the frustrating things about being an MP, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to be an mm. MP was to get stuff done. You you get there. And then you find that you have to go through a lot of trudging through treacle sometimes to get things done. And the common sense solution is right there in front of you. But, oh, my goodness, getting people to see it can take a long, long time. And so to Anne, I'm sorry, I would love to be able to give you an answer right now and more than that, a supermarket. But we're still on the case. And um, things like petitions, which Wayne Harvest set up for it, mm. they all help. OK, Anna, you've got another question. There. Yeah, you were talking earlier about doctors. Uh, Christine and Coombe Dingle got in touch. She was a nurse and trained in the 1970s. She said, I wish Charlotte had mentioned nurses too. The NHS would be far worse without their dedication and hard work. Now, this is going to get, comes back to the old management structure. And I, 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 there's an element from what you said. I had the image of Sir Lancelot Spratt in my head, of the sort of the all-powerful surgeon uh, and indeed the all-powerful matron. But that model didn't really work, did it? Well, it's interesting. I'm sorry if I didn't mention nurses. When I've been talking about this before, mm. I've made a big point of doing so because excellent nurses are absolutely the backbone mm. of our NHS. And what's interesting, and I, I want to do a piece of work on this, um, talking to older nurses, and forgive forgive me if I've <laughs> been rude to anyone in saying that, but nurses who've been have got more experience, they say this, but they've seen a tremendous change in the culture and the expectation of what nursing actually is. Um, yes, there's a lot more demand, which makes it more difficult, but the focus is less on caring 
and more on sort of tick boxing and other tasks. Um, what I would like to do, and I'd be very interested to hear from um, people who've been nurses for a, for a time in my constituency and beyond, of what they think's actually changed and what we can do to bring back um, the ethos of nursing that I think did work better. And, you know, we, it's very easy to look at the past and say, oh, back in the good old days. And, you know, but there nurses were problems- didn't, weren't trained to degree level there. We, we, the nursing staff that we've got today is better qualified than we've ever had in the past. They are to degree standard. The word that comes up within that, indeed the, the Royal College of Nursing, the RCN has said this, is that caring. You They've- can't, you know, they would be coming up with a module to train yeah. nurses how to care, which I'm, you know, fall off the fence here for a moment. I think that's potty. Yeah. You can't train somebody to care. Either you do or you don't. You're right. I think it's part of a, a wider trend that, that it hits all sorts of training for various things, that we think we can sit people in a seminar room and teach them stuff that you can only learn by doing. You know, you can't learn to ride a bike by sitting in a but seminar room and do a module. You, though, you know, you can't, you can't learn to care. No, you can you, learn how to absolutely. do it, but you either are a caring person or you're absolutely. not. So it's the kind of people you recruit who have a sort of a vocation and we often use this word in the wrong sense, a vocation, a calling to care. Yeah. Um, but also, there are certain things, and I'm not a nurse, so perhaps people tell me if I'm wrong, but you do need to practice in terms of spotting signs that someone's dehydrated, um, mm. spotting signs that someone is in pain and needs attention, even though particularly the elderly, they might not say so. Those are things you actually need to be on the hospital ward floor to know. And you can't learn that in a seminar room. You actually have to be there. So I agree, getting people who are vocationally, i.e. a calling, uh, vocation is often used to mean practice manual and technical skills. It's not what it really means at all. It means a calling, voco vocare, from the Latin, if you want to get academic about it. Um, people who have that are, are calling to care, but also who are given the training experience to actually be on the hospital ward and get to know patients and, and learn it that way. Let's go to Frenchay and Southmead, because, of course, yeah. Frenchay, not in your constituency, Southmead is in your constituency, and we have the new All Singing or Dancing Super Hospital on its way. That has caused concern with Frenchay and one of the ministers uh, in the government. Steve Webb, uh, the uh, pensions minister, MP for Thornbridge, has been very concerned about the bus transportation to Southmead, and people at Southmead very concerned about the fact that there isn't any parking. Mm, Harold got in touch. This is on the parking restrictions. So, Charlotte, because of parking restrictions, is it true that staff are having to park at French A and then ultimately catch a bus to get to Southmead? I'm not, I haven't yet had that directly said to me, so mm. I wouldn't want to comment on it because I may be wrong, but I wouldn't be surprised. I've had it said to me. Have you? Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, and I think, I mean, I... <laughs> Here, 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 I have huge concerns that we've built this massive super hospital with less beds. I think the planning around the hospital is a lot to be desired. Now, I know people say that we want to get people out of hospital and into the home quicker. I know people say that we're moving towards community-based services and community-based care. That's all well and good. But given that the rise in population we're seeing in Bristol, people moving to this great city, mm. ageing population, more complex needs, I find it extraordinary that we've been that optimistic that we think we can actually reduce the beds and guess but what i haven't have seen i haven't seen a revolution though, in Things community have, care well, no, yet so we, i have we concerns do have, we do have medical advances if you had your appendix out you would be in hospital for four or five weeks a generation ago if you had your tonsils out well you don't have your tonsils out anymore because they don't do that but you know if you a lot of operations would require a hospital stay absolutely 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. Now they don't. Absolutely. Now, I really hope I'm wrong. I really hope people will listen to this interview in, in 10 years' time and go, what on earth was she talking about? She got it wrong, didn't she? I really hope that's mm. the case. I have a hunch that with the rising population of Bristol, we've been over-optimistic in cutting down on beds because okay. I don't think the improvements are matching the population rise. Um, and I've spoken to a couple of doctors who say I'm not completely bonkers to say that. But I think that ties in with, with the parking issue as well, which I know I haven't raised. Um, it's, and I'm it's, also, a, it's a serious issue. I mean, it's a very serious issue. Very serious issue. Um, and and the, the streets around there, uh, it's oh, absolutely like this is. I drive through this. Um, these streets um, every, every weekend and Thursday and every day when I'm when I'm here the whole time. It mm. is a very big issue, and I feel worried that the planners. It's a great hospital. Don't I'm not talking down the hospital. It's mm. great that we have it, but I am concerned about the parking. Let's talk about something which again is transport related. You were actually on that trial run of the train that went down the Henbury Loop. You've been very vocal on this particular topic. We are going to be exploring the Henbury Loop, uh, the, the 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 need for train stations for various points within our area, not least of which Portishead, where I live, and of course Canesham and Salford want a train station as well and we get to find out what the total cost of all this is going to be, which I think may make it pie in the sky. Mm. And in the past we've had a lot of people ask the same question. This is from Philip in Fieldson. Charlotte, what's the latest on getting Henbury Loop Railway? By the way, I think you're a very hard-working MP. 
Oh, thank you, very. It's always <laughs> nice to hear that. You get a lot of complaints. Probably Charlotte Leslie fan club. Anyway, uh, I mean, there's, probably, a... there's probably only one, but that, that's made my day. Um, it's This is another one of those things which is complete common sense, and I'm still trying to unravel why it's taken so long to get. Before I say anything, I have been vocal about it. If you want to see a train line from Filton over to Shirehampton, the Henbury Loop, and I'd like to see a Hawfield station incorporated into mm. that loop, go to www.henburyloop.bristolpetition.com petitions.com sign the petition and pass on to your friends but why hasn't it happened i have to say i think it's just a terminal lack of ambition amongst decision makers there is in a li- the area let's just deal with the facts here. there's a line there yes that line is not capable of taking passenger transport it's, well, a, it's a freight line well it moment. did because we chartered a train along it uh, yeah on a, on a regular basis I it mean, would one, need one it train need, does not constitute a, a regular no, service it right? would need an investment between 20 and 25 million it's been estimated to put that back into passenger service who pay for it um the government um department for transport and there's there's money um in bristol as well to pay for it and also the franchisees would pay for it so it'd have so. to be subsidized but what the point is is there are there are capital allocations available from government to do big infrastructure projects like this and the problem with bristol has been in the past is we haven't been ambitious enough with the projects or we've bickered amongst ourselves everyone in this area remembers the tram debacle where we just decided to have a local bickering match <laughs> as opposed to get on and sort out our city's transport um, i've been urging the west of england partnership to look at the sense of this and to put in a bid because governments like big game-changing infrastructure projects and sometimes it's better to big bid for a big ambitious project that costs more than fiddling around at the seams because it, it won't won't be as efficient use of money. Now, Though, those those who may be looking at HS2 probably might disagree with you on that one. But I, 25 million quid, as opposed to whatever that's well, we'll nine it, billion pounds or whatever, the, exactly 80 billion pounds. Sorry, and put it this way: they're spending 13 million on renovating the, the parking at Bristol Parkway. Mm. Now that, that's half of what a Henbury Loop line would mm. cost. If there was a Henbury Loop line, I would never get. So have you not? I would the never door? put my car anywhere near Parkway. If they'd done the Henbury Loop, they could have then assessed the so parking have you needs not to Parkway. Patrick McLaughlin's door, the d- 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 Secretary of State for Transport, and said, have you got 25 quid you can... Oh, yes. And he said what? He <laughs> said what? He said, this is, this is a, sometimes the curse of localism, he said, well, it's up to the, the local decision makers, West England Partnership, to put together the bid. I can't comment on the business plan. It was actually Simon Burns, the rail minister, who I talked to about this. And it was Simon Burns, the rail minister, who said, well, look... Even though the West of England Partnership have said it doesn't look like you need a Henbury Loop, you need a, a ridiculous Henbury Spur turnback station, you make a lot of sense. I'm going to ask them to relook at it. Now, what I'm trying to find out is the terms of reference which the West of England Partnership and those looking at it are actually using to look at the business okay. case. Okay. So, if anyone's listening, can I have those terms of reference, please? It'll be it, handy. We, we, we would like them as well, actually. So, send them to Charlotte. I think Hanley. they should be public. Yeah, they should be definitely should be public. Uh, let's return to something which you've uh, recently come out against, th- Trash uh, Hawfield. Trash Hallfield were on this programme when they launched their judicial review uh, onto the uh, Rovers Stadium, which, of course, comes back to their argument about Bristol and, indeed, the West, for that matter. We never get anything done because as soon as you, somebody comes up with a bright idea, someone comes along and says, no, thank you very much. You're for it. I am. OK. Now, th- are you also for Ashton Vale? Yes. So you want Stadia in both? Yes, but the thing is, what we've what we've got here is a situation where Ashton Vale is, is is actually I think far more difficult to achieve, and I I don't like the concept of a small group of people with a, with with a basically a niche interest holding up something that's going to but it's process, put the city Charlotte forward. Leslie. That is process. That is how the democracy works. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, it's process. But I think. But you always have to... Democracy is a very difficult thing. You always have to ask yourself whether this is actually in the interests of, of, of the city or a, a small group of interests. Now, people are completely entitled. Thank goodness we live in a society where people are able to make their voice heard. But also... There's, there's loopholes that can be used and there's ways that you, you laws can be used and rules can be used in ways they weren't intended to be done. All I'm saying is that I think, and I'm, you know, I think the trash group are not representative of Bristol as a whole. Mm. I think it's a great shame. People didn't want a Rovers stadium at the memorial ground. OK, that's fine. What was going to go there? Well, it was probably always going to be a supermarket if it wasn't a state. Because they're the only ones, or a housing estate. A- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you can be guaranteed there'd probably be objections to a housing estate well, as there well. Are, I mean, the, the, this is, the, this t- come, you've got to comment on this, but yeah. this also, food for thought here, this also includes affordable housing, which is probably one of the biggest issues that your your constituency, amongst any other, other constituency in the in the region, faces. is is this lack of affordable housing for your constituents. Anyway, let's have a comment. Just on that, actually, Chris from C Mills, uh, is Charlotte going to put as much effort in in support 
support of Ashton Vale as she has done with Horfield. One of the things, there's there's quite strict rules about how much an MP can interfere in another MP's area in constituency. Mm. And South Bristol is, isn't my turf and I wouldn't, it would be very rude of me to start intruding on other MPs' areas. So I concentrate on what is my area and things that I can take control of. Okay. Um, but I think that the general rule is, is that Bristol, to be honest, it's appalling that we haven't got a stadium. We haven't got a conference centre. Bournemouth has got a conference centre. If Bob Dylan comes to the area, he goes to Cardiff. I'm sorry, it's just not acceptable. And we haven't got a transport system that's comparable with other cities. Come on, Bristol, let's get on with it. OK, um, we're running short of time. I want to deal with a couple of other political things here. Um, a couple of MPs have been in the news. In fact, one of them we've been, has been the basis of what we've been talking about this morning. Uh, the Equalities Minister, Joe Winston standing up for, ter- for 20 minutes at PMQ's Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's question time uh, not being uh, offered a seat by her male colleagues, it would appear. She says she was happy standing. Would you want a seat if you were pregnant? I have no idea. I have no idea what being pregnant's like. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, OK, but if you were, if you were seven um, months pregnant, would you want your male colleagues to offer you a seat? Um, I think it would be nice, yes. But also, to be honest, I, as, a, as a woman, I think I would like to think that I would offer a female colleague a seat if she was pregnant. I don't think it's just about men offering a seat, although I, I tremendously value chivalry. I always like it when a man ho- holds the door open for me. Um, and I think it'd be a nice gesture, yes. Gloria De Perio uh, has been talking about her past. She had photographs taken of her topless when she was 15 years old. Those pictures are about... What on earth are you going to ask, John? I'm not going to ask. With it. Well, do you have any pictures of those <laughs> that are likely to come out in the newspaper? Do you have Thank any, goodness, no. Anything, any photos? Photographs that are likely to come out of you, Charlotte <laughs> Leslie, that you would be worried about. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. But you, but have there are, you have a past, don't you? Yes. Do you worry about anything of your past coming out? Um, no, I don't, probably because I've had a very boring past. <laughs> um, but is it right that a, an MP's past, like those pictures for uh, Gloria De Perio or, or anybody else, their past when they were not an MP is, is exposed? Is Do you know a- what? I think... I think it is just one of those things. If you go and put yourself in a position where you're publicly elected, you've asked the public to elect you and you're in the public eye... It may be good, it may be bad, but it's just one of those things that's going to happen. You yeah. know, you do, and you, that's why you have to talk to your family about it. It does put your family in the public eye, and of course it puts your past in the public eye. It would be nice if people were all terribly decent and didn't go there, mm-hmm. but that's not the way the world is. As long as people want to see pictures of, in, of interesting pictures of public people's past, then there will still be a market for them. Um, hopefully, unless, unless it's been so extravagant I've completely forgotten all about it, um, there's nothing to go fishing around for, I'm afraid. OK, well, that's almost a challenge for journalists to go <laughs> Fishing around, you shouldn't have said that. Well, there's, there's, there's some footage of me as a 13-year-old in a boxing gym being a bit feisty, and there is some footage of my judge, uh, my I've grudge being... I've seen that on Points West. You were filmed yes, for Points West I for was. Yeah, I was. I, I, looked like a, I looked like a spotty 13-year-old boy, which is nice. Um, and my, my, <laughs> my grudge was judged on Big Breakfast with uh, Robbie Williams and Gary Barlow. Robbie Williams said I, sh- I should box, and Gary Barlow said I shouldn't. So if you can find that, that will be impressive. Well, a while away the weekend, I suppose. <laughs> uh, let's just deal with you and, and your ambition. Obviously, you weren't part of the um, the sort of the soft shoe shuffle, as um, a fellow uh, West MP called it um, uh, uh, earlier. Do you have ambitions? Um, it's a funny thing. People always ask you that. And if I'd had an ambition to be an MP, I don't think I ever would have become one. And my ambition, it's going to sound a bit cliche, but it's true, is to be myself in the biggest, best possible way. And I've got an idea that if as long as you do that, the rest will take care of itself. I suppose that's a, a, a reasonable answer, but health is a passion of yours. You've been very vocal on, on other issues. Uh, there aren't that many women in, in government, in, from the point of view of being a junior MP, let alone in the Cabinet. You know, my, my key aim, the reason I went into politics, is to change things. I've got this annoying fire in my belly where I get inflamed at what I see to be injustice and I just want to change things. I'm not too fussed whether I have what title I have while I'm changing mm. those things. If it's a minister, that's lovely. If it's not a minister, that's lovely. I just want to be in a position to actually change things. And one of the most amazing things about being an MP is I think so many people, like I did, rant at their TV, um, rant at the papers and feel so powerless to change anything at all um i was just just devastated and so frustrated with that that's what drove me into it the privilege of being able to do that and also so many people don't get their voices heard or can't make their voices heard particularly whistleblowers in the nhs Mm. as an example it's such a privilege to be able to take people's voices who can't get it heard and have a platform to make it very loud and be their loudspeaker that's something that i just i'm thankful every day i'm able to do you're going to stand next time 
Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, um, you mentioned that you, 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 you've never been pregnant, you haven't got a baby. What about, you know, things that you may want to do personally? It, having a... I don't, I don't even know if you're married <laughs> or not. So, are, are you married? I, I, I'm not, John. No, okay, I'm not. OK. Um, it's, it's very difficult. It is very difficult. And particularly do you want having... a family? Um, at the moment, I'm very, very driven by what I'm doing at the moment. Um, but that will, that will come at a cost then, surely? Yes, it, it will. I think being a woman, it is very difficult, particularly I'm, I'm 35 at this mm. kind of age. You do start thinking, you know, can I, can I have a family? How will it balance with politics? Um, maybe do you I'm feel being... pressure to have a family? No, I don't. Um, I feel pressure in that I might look back when I'm older and think, oh, blimey, you got that wrong. Um, and that the really? things I'm concerned about now, when I'm a bit older, might think, well, it didn't really matter that much. But the point is, I am as I am now. Mm. And I've also found in life that worrying about it doesn't make it any better. I'm, I'm a great believer in, in doing your best, doing what you feel is right, and things somehow working out. Now, I'll tell you in, in 50 years' time whether I'm, I, I mean, whether I'm right or not. But it's a very difficult one, isn't it? Because, again, it, it is part of, part of being a woman. is that it's Obviously, you mm. have to make sacrifices if you're going to have mm. a family. There's also the pressure of a partner saying, you know, I can't have a kid. Mm. Is that a pressure you feel? Um, oh, this is very personal. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's important to yeah. who you are, and it's important from the point of view of understanding the pressures that you as a female it is. MP, no, absolutely. the 147, who, you know, are in Parliament. I, I do, and sometimes when I, you know, I go to mother and toddler groups and I mm. see women of my age who have got a family, and sometimes I think, have I got this very wrong? But... And in many ways, it's a nuisance. I really... It sounds really clichéd. I really care about my constituents mm. and my constituency. And I don't, at the moment, see how I can put them second priority. There might, that might be an absolute personal life disaster. Um, we'll have to see. But at the moment, I absolutely love my job and love what I'm doing. And who has it said that if you find a job you love, you never have to work again? It's one of the reasons I do what I do. Uh, Charlotte Leslie, maybe in 15 years' time we'll probably explore this again. <laughs> Certainly next year you'll be back for your hot seat. But for now, Charlotte Leslie, MP for Bristol North West. Val, by the way, in Westbury on Trim says, well done, never stop working. Thank you. Uh, so that's another one of your constituents as well. <laughs> Charlotte Leslie, many thanks.